Hi, guys. Our guest today has over 20 years experience in the martial arts world. He studied and teaches multiple disciplines that include a self-defense synthesis and Tai Chi. He is the owner and chief instructor of Darsana Martial Arts, and this has brought him closer to his goal of spreading harmony through physical excellence. Today, we chat with Sifu Grant Kleiman. How are you today, sir? I'm good. Thanks, Mark. And uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Well, we just have a few questions for you, and then we'll get out to you here because I know you're very busy teaching. So let's get on with the interview, sir. So the first question, how did you get started in the martial arts, sir? So, you know, I always tell people my first martial arts lesson was when I was six years old, and I said to my dad, I need to know how to fight. And he said, okay, you, you hit him either in the nose, the solar plexus, Last resort is the groin. So I always think I learned how to strike down the center line uh, at an early age. But uh, officially, you know, even though uh, when I was younger, I was very interested in doing the martial arts for various reasons, I wasn't able to actually take classes. So I would just try to find people who knew stuff and they would show me a move here and there. I was always interested, but it wasn't until I was 19 that I officially began uh, my training. And that was under uh, Sifu Ray Hager of the Chinese Boxing Institute International. What style was that, if you don't mind me asking? No, it's an interesting question. So they, they taught what they called uh, the Chinese boxing synthesis. And uh, it's really a number of different Chinese martial arts. Uh, and with uh, my teacher, we also had an element of Wally J's small circle jujitsu in there, and then just some other elements from, from his training and his past. So it included uh, at the time, and this was really the foundation and central core of my training, Chen Tai Chi. So uh, the CBII had an association with the Chen tai, American Chen Tai Chi Association. And so uh, I got my start, really, my first class was the beginning of Lao Jet, the, the first Tai Chi form. And we also trained in uh, Wing Chun, uh, Fuji and White Crane, Bagua Zhang, uh, Jing Yi, uh, a little known art called Wa Lu, a couple of other uh, lesser known things such as um, uh, just chin all systems and my teacher also developed sort of his own ground fighting system that incorporated elements of some of the some of the other things that we were training so it's quite a quite a broad curriculum uh, quite a lot to learn uh, but always the the chen tai chi remained sort of the central hub and that was a big part of the the foundation of, of my practice Okay, and this is the uh, self-defense synthesis that we had spoken of before, right? Well, actually, that is an evolution uh, for me. So um, I trained with my first teacher for a little over six years, and for various reasons, um, I ended up leading the school. And when I did that, I had sort of in mind a kind of track that I wanted to go down, uh, certain things I wanted to learn that I thought different styles uh, were sort of specialized in or approached in an intelligent way. So um, first I wanted to find a teacher to complete my, my Chen Tai Chi training because I had learned the long form and I had learned uh, the, the straight sword, the uh, Jian, uh, and some, some other elements such as push hands and other, other elements of partner practice. But I still felt there was a lot to learn from each one of the styles that were synthesized in the CBII's curriculum. So uh, I found uh, my current Sifu, uh, Monk Yun Ro. I'll get into that probably a little bit later. Uh, but at the same time, I was still uh, going to classes, seminars, doing different things uh, for Wing Chun, Bagua. Those were the two main arts from the Chinese boxing synthesis I really wanted to go deeper into. I also did a little bit more Xing Yi along the way. But then I also trained in Guillermo Arnis, uh, which is a Filipino system of martial arts, which I thought had a different approach to trapping and uh, striking than Wing Chun did. And I wanted to kind of get that, that element in there. And uh, I did a little bit of Aikido and Judo along the way, um, mostly working with, with friends who were, who were into those arts. Uh, and just sort of a, a variety of things. I incorporated some boxing into what I was doing. I started to research other systems of grappling, like wrestling and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, down the road a piece, 
as I was working on putting all these things together for myself, I came across uh, Combat Sistema, which is uh, founded by a guy named Kevin Secours in, in Canada, in Montreal, Canada. And I started a correspondence course of training with him, which was really just sort of um, a way of taking all the things that I had learned and putting them together. I, I really sort of found a kinship in the way that he put things together and also the way that he taught things. And so uh, I started going through that uh, curriculum as well. And it just helped me to sort of organize some of the things that I was already doing and kind of streamline them a little bit. So your self-defense synthesis is a culmination of everything that you've gone through and everything that you've learned. And still evolving. Yeah. Still evolving. That's what we like, because it is a, a living martial art. So you teach the self-defense synthesis as well as Taiji Chen, Chen style. And you had mentioned that your Sifu now, your present Sifu is Monk Yon Rao. Yeah. How did you get connected with him? Because you, you said you were first with uh, Ray Hagar at the Chinese Boxing Institute, you said? Yeah. After I had left that school, like I said, I was there for Ray Hagar's school for about uh, just a little over six years. And I had a little hiatus. I was on my own for about, a, say, like a year, year and a half. And I, I realized that the next step in my, in my journey had to be to, you know, complete my Tai Chi training. I just, I knew that there were things I didn't understand yet, things I hadn't progressed to. I needed some guidance in that. So um, what do you do when you're looking for something these days? I went online and I started uh, searching for a teacher somewhere in the area. And uh, that's how I found Monkey Unruh. Now, what was interesting, sort of a small world kind of thing, is he is uh, one of the senior students of, of Max Yen, who is the founder of the American Chen Tai Chi Association, which I said was at the time that I joined the CBII, the two organizations were associated. And that was actually the Tai Chi uh, that I learned, at least for the first three years. After that, uh, the CBII had, had a connection with Chen Jiao Wang. And so they're, they're, the, the Tai Chi, that the Chen Tai Chi lineage and the movements, uh, that's the Chen Jiao Pi lineage, and it was just a little bit of a different approach to the form. So it was almost like I had to relearn all the forms. And then now about four or five years later, I ended up having to sort of go back through and, and readjust things. But it was, it was a really good experience because, you know, I had already had almost like around eight years of training. And I was really concerned knowing that I wanted this to be my career, that a new teacher was going to, you know, bust me back to, to zero and start me all over again. And perhaps that was the wrong attitude for me to have. But at the time I was looking to sort of complete my training, not start over. And, uh, he was, he was really kind of wise and gracious, and he just looked at what I did and evaluated what I was already doing, and then just kind of went in and helped me to sort of fill the gaps, to refine the things that I was doing, and, uh, and, and that's really been the, the nature of our relationship since then. Uh, it's, uh, it's been very special. Well, something definitely has to be said to your merit at the fact that he didn't have to correct all that much. He saw what you were working with and just saw that all he had to do was just build upon what you had. I don't know if there wasn't that much to correct. I'll, I'll relate a, a story, but um, so, you know, after the first class, it, in my first class, uh, because I, when I had met him, I'd asked for private lessons and he, he wanted me to join his group class first, I guess sort of a vetting system to see whether or not I was, uh, I was worthy of, of the time and effort to become an indoor student, which is kind of what I was looking for. So uh, after the first class, I was, uh, I was put with a, I was put with a, um, one of his other students and uh, just, we just didn't mesh well. And so I was kind of like, ah, maybe this isn't what I'm looking for. And I was going to leave. And, and then he stopped me and he said, Hey, come over here. And he said, let's, let's do a little, a little push hands. And so I got into my stance and I, I felt pretty confident in my skill at this point. Um, pretty rooted. And, you know, I understood what I was doing. So we touched and in a, very short order, I found my, my rear in the dirt. And I just figured, you know, the ground, the grass was a little bit slippery. It had rained. I got up, said, all right, well, I dug in. I was ready now. And I found myself even more quickly on my butt. And uh, so I realized something's going on here. I tried again and to no avail. And I said, okay, well, what, what's going on? Like, what are you doing? Why can't I, why can't I redirect your force? What's going on? He goes, oh, well, you know, 
you're, you're missing the vertical circle. You, you've lost three dimensions in your movement or, you know, you don't have that. And as soon as he said that from my previous time training in the lineage that he, he's a part of, I realized exactly what he meant. And I said, okay, this guy, this guy knows what he's doing. This guy has the stuff I'm looking for. So there was plenty, plenty to correct, but also thankfully plenty to build off of. And yes, I, I didn't have to go all the way back to the beginning. Oh, that's great. So your self-defense synthesis um, in, 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 would you be able to consider that as a, like, a, if we're talking in terms of external, internal, hard versus soft kind of style, would you consider your synthesis more of a hard style? And then you have your Taiji chin, which then complements that as being your soft style? So the terms hard and soft, internal and external are, are thrown around a lot in the martial arts world and people will mean different things by them, maybe widely different, maybe subtly different. And while I'm not going to try to tell anybody how those terms need to be defined for their use, let me define them for my own so that I can answer that question and show how for me, uh, they do ultimately my self-defense synthesis and Tai Chi practice do weave together, but perhaps not, not uh, in the way that someone might expect at first glance. So, um, so first of all, hard and soft, I think of, of a hard style as basically, let's just say force on force, where someone is looking to develop superior power, st superior stability and strength, and maybe even actual physical hardness, developing their bones and conditioning their body to be able to just weather and endure force. And then when they strike or grab, it's going to be uh, undeniable, right? That's, that's kind of hard style. They're going to impose their will and it will not be denied. So that's how I think of it. And uh, then soft style is something of the opposite. The idea is that you are going to uh, evade, you're going to redirect, you're going to try to utilize the force that the other person brings into the scenario and redirect it into something that's going to be either neutralizing their aggression or uh, perhaps then uh, returning their force back on them in some way, uh, but in some way be useful for you in order to you know, obviously avoid uh, getting hurt. But also you, some people might say that a soft style is not, let's say, focused on hurting the other opponent, but rather than neutralizing their aggression. So there's also something of a sort of attitudinal or philosophical difference there in the approach. So that's how I think about hard and soft. One imposes their force, the other one tries to use the other person's force. Internal and external to me are different things than hard and soft. Uh, an internal style, internal, is about uh, inside movement, inside activity, inside processes, right? So it means that whatever you're doing is mostly happening on the inside and isn't something that is obviously visible to uh, somebody looking at you or looking at the effect you're having on somebody else or the effect that they are or aren't having on you when they seem to be applying, you know, what, what would ordinarily cause a different effect. So, so it's uh, sometimes, sometimes those things are called hidden force or mysterious force and those kinds of things. And really it just has to do with the fact uh, from my, from my perspective that the things that are happening, the dynamics taking place are happening uh, within, within the body, within your person and are not something that's obviously visible. And it has a bit of a different approach, different way of thinking. Um, it has more to do with the way the mind and the intent and awareness interacts with your body and the other person's body um, than perhaps just the way that physical shapes and forms are interacting with each other versus external, which is about physical shape and form. Um, and so, you know, when you're doing, say, an external style or approach, you're going to be doing, uh, you know, something that's going to work primarily off of what we would typically think of as athleticism. You know, you want to be a bit faster. You want to be a bit stronger, more agile. You want to be cl more clever in the way that you move to outmaneuver the other person, better timing, these sorts of things. M maybe just, um, just physically outclassing the other person. And, um, you know, this is something that obviously is going to reduce over time. Athleticism just goes away. We can hold on to some of it, but with age, with time and with wear and tear, it does, it does dwindle to some degree, especially if we're talking about combat and, um, fighting and combat sports. Whereas, you know, the argument of an internal martial artist would be, you know, that his internal development can, can continue to improve and increase even as his sort of physical athleticism dwindles. I don't know if that is as sort of cut and dry as it's oftentimes quoted, but I think there's some truth to that. But anyways, those would be the differences for me. So now to answer your question based on those terms. Um, 
so for me, the, my Tai Chi practice is by and large an internal practice. Now, obviously there's going to be physical movement going on, but the physical movement is either A, to generate some kind of internal movement, some kind of internal change or transition or transfer process in the body, or it is generated by an internal movement change process in the body. So it's very much internal development. And I look at Tai Chi practice for me and for my students, the way I teach it as a cultivation practice, you know, in a way as a form of conditioning, it's just internal conditioning. So primarily I use my Tai Chi to change the quality of everything that I do to make it better. And also there are certain principles which are arguably what you might call soft principles as opposed to hard principles. In Tai Chi, we follow the philosophy of Wei Wu Wei, meaning doing without doing. So uh, we don't impose our force. We don't insist on a certain sort of posture or way of being or position. Uh, but nor do we uh, retreat, run away from force or um, disengage with it entirely. We join with it, right? We learn to blend our, ourselves and our physical condition and our intention with what the opponent is doing both physically and mentally, if you will, or intentionally. And um, that kind of gets a little bit into ideas about chi, but I'm going to leave that for later and uh, just say that because it, the Tai Chi training is a, let's say, a way of conditioning the mind and body and a way of approaching anything you do. It doesn't even have to be martial arts, right? Tai Chi can be uh, about the way you um, the way you dance, if we're staying physical, the way you walk, but it can go beyond that. It can be the way you approach drawing or doing a podcast, at least on the philosophical level. So, um, so yeah, so our Tai Chi informs everything and that's what Darsana means. It's a Sanskrit word that means vision and the logo means seeing everything through the lens of the Tai Chi principle. So now coming to the self-defense synthesis, I had a little, uh, Years ago, I had a little existential crisis. I was trying to align my understanding of Taoist philosophy and Tai Chi theory, this idea of always seeking harmony with my understanding of violence on a practical level, right? So, you know, I, I had kind of at one point started going down a road that I would argue was sort of similar to Aikido, very, very soft style, to the point where I was even thinking about taking out strikes because I felt, well, if there's impact, then there's disharmony. So that was sort of where my mind was at the time. This is uh, going back maybe almost you know, like eight years or so. And um, so I, I was trying to come up with this idea of a blending approach, the idea of always redirecting force into neutralization with the goal of, of, not, of not necessarily harming the person or certainly not intending to purposely harm the person. Uh, but if they got harm, it would be because of their own force, their own energy, what they put into the system. And my, my harmonization with it just sort of bounced it back to them, so to speak. But I came to, to feel that there were certain practical limitations to this. And I just started watching some uh, CCTV videos of some kind of horrific violent events and uh, really, really kind of taking a hard look in the mirror and asking myself, like, am I preparing my students for the sorts of violence that they may really run out to? Does, does this really work? And so uh, we started pressure testing some things. I gave like a, a training knife to a, to a student. I said, I just want you to grab me and, you know, basically kind of go a little psycho and let's see what we got. And I started to see certain things break down a little bit. Now that can entirely be limitations of my own skill, but I did feel like, okay, well, maybe there is something I'm missing here, but it, it, it kind of messed me up for a while. And I, I really struggled with where does Tai Chi begin in violence or Tai Chi end rather in violence begin. But eventually, you know, the thing that really integrated the two for me is I, I said, well, you know, what Taoist and Tai Chi practitioners always do is we look at nature, right? And we say, well, what's going on in, in nature? What's going on in the natural world? And you look at the natural world and there's tremendous violence in the natural world. And I'm not only talking about between animals, but even just forces of nature can be violent, sudden dramatic change, potentially harmful. And it's like, well, how do you harmonize with that? And I realized that the harm, it, being sort of, let's say, overly passive or peaceful in a violent situation is tantamount to parking in the middle of a highway. You aren't harmonizing with the circumstances. The circumstances are violent. Therefore, for that period of time, 
violence is called for. And then when the violence is over, you cease being violent, like water settling back to a placid, calm state after being agitated. So when I kind of was able to make that sort of philosophical connection for myself, I, I started to reincorporate aspects of, of martial arts and aspects of training that were potentially seen as quote unquote hard if you look at striking and so forth hard. But the philosophy of doing without doing, the philosophy of going with the other person's motion and force, that remains in the self-defense system to the degree that uh, we're able to do it. But at the same time, there is a level of practicality and there's nothing wrong with hitting the person who's trying to hit you. Here, here. I do understand that. I, I fully, that covers the self-defense synthesis. Sifu Grant, we switch gears into this one. If there was one thing that you could teach a new generation of martial arts, whether it be young or old, what would it be? You don't have to choose between a traditional approach, whether that be a, a cultural traditional approach, such as, say, carrying on Chen Tai Chi, uh, or just the tradition of this is the way my teacher taught me. You don't have to choose necessarily between doing that and following your own, your own insight and you, taking ownership of your own art those two things can be integrated. You can have respect, in other words, for your ancestors and the wisdom that they have to provide you and always look to that for, uh, for, for nourishment to draw from that deep well. But at the same time, you don't have to shackle yourself to it. You can continue to uh, explore, learn broadly, but most importantly, give yourself permission to pursue the things that you think are true, even if they seem potentially to contradict what the tradition is teaching. Uh, in my experience in doing that, you end up oftentimes circling to an understanding where you realize more deeply what the tradition was trying to teach you, uh, but you understand it in your own way, or you, you have the potential of updating that tradition, seeing some, some new thread that perhaps wasn't seen before you. And I really think that that's what those traditions all started out as anyways. So regardless of style, regardless of your goals and your training, I think the most important thing to learn is that those two things are compatible. They're not, they're not opposing. So you're saying don't, be, don't let tradition hold you down or, or, or better said, don't hold on to, to, to tradition too tightly. But also don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? You know, it goes both ways. And this is, this is the Tai Chi principle at work, right? You have what is known and what is already, you know, what is being passed down, what is solid. And then you have potential, what is unknown. And we have to find a way to take order and chaos and merge them into something that produces growth. Sound advice, sir. Which brings us on to our last question for you, Siku Grant. If people need to get in contact with you, how do they do that? Yeah, so um, you can visit us uh, on our website, darsanamartialarts.com. Uh, you can email us at info at darsanamartialarts.com. Uh, you can text us to 954-960-2789. And also check us out on YouTube. Just type in Darsana Martial Arts in the uh, search bar and uh, check out some of our videos. All right. All right. Facebook, Instagram? Yeah, we have a Facebook, Darsana Martial Arts.com. I mean, Darsana Martial Arts on Facebook, Darsana Martial Arts on Instagram. Absolutely. Information for Sifu Grant and Darsana Martial Arts in the description below. Also in the description below, is a link for Fair You Shoes. You need Fair You Shoes, go ahead, click on that link and get your shoes right now. All right, Sifu Grant, thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you, Sifu Mark. It was my pleasure. See you later. See you.